Okay, well, that takes us to the last lesson. I really hope that you've enjoyed this class. Um, there are just a few things I wanted to emphasize. First off, um, I mentioned in the and uh, when we were in Second Kings um, about how I, I, I talked about the fact that God was holy, and I said that it was not about Naboth's vineyard. Um, I, I I looked that up, and it is I was actually talking about Naboth's vineyard, so I did have the the right reference there. First Kings twenty one one through eighteen. After Naboth's vineyard, God gives judgment. Excuse me, a judgment against them, and says what's going to happen. But at the same time, in the next section there, um, it mentions very specifically that there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the sight of the Lord. And yet, when he would turn, repents, God forgives him. The, someone who who had just said there was no one like him who did evil, but he repented, and the Lord heard. No matter what you've done, God is faithful, and He will forgive. When you turn to him, okay? But at the same time, God is holy, and so so he, so he does have wrath towards the sin. Um, as twenty as 21, 1 through 8 shows us, after they act so, disright, uh, so unrighteous with uh, Naboth's vineyard. Um, so the, I wanted to emphasize that because I, I, um, I left out um, some stuff there and wanted to make sure it was a little bit clearer because I, I definitely did mess up on that. Um, so... Um, so that takes us to Obadiah, um, and Obadiah prophesied sometime between 586 and 500. Um, this was either during the time of Babylon or during the time of Persia. It's not really clear. It doesn't really matter for the point of the book. Because his audience was not Israel or Judah, his audience was Edom. If you remember, Edom was the descendants of Esau, who is southeast of Israel. Okay. So on your on if you're looking at me, it's over there. Um, so anyways, um, the basic message is that God would judge Edom for its evil actions towards God's people. And when Israel was being um, was being taken over, Edom was over there rejoicing and doing very backwards things, um, um, persecuting the the people. So uh, as I mentioned, Edom came from Esau. Genesis twenty five thirty. We'll give you more on that. Um, in Jesus' time, however, the land of Edom is called Idumea. Okay? Um, if you turn to Mark chapter 3, verses 7 through 8, you'll actually see it listed there. It says, uh, Jesus withdrew to the sea with his disciples, and a great multitude from Galilee followed, and also from Judea, and from Jerusalem, and from Idumea, and beyond the Jordan, and the vicinity of Tyre and Sidon, a great number of people. Um, so, uh, that that well, we'll talk about that later, but the boundary of Edomia is a little bit different than the boundary of Edom. Um, so here it is, right here. Whoops, sorry. So here it is, right here, Edom, and you can see that that, that, it, that it's it does it does it does grow and shrink throughout the course of time. But you know, um, definitely did prey on the fact that Israel was or Judah was fell to Babylon. So this is just some pictures that I found on the internet about. Um, about uh, uh, Edom. If you look, see this is a person right here, and here's the walkway up. Uh, Edom had, especially this city was built up in the up in the. See, look at that plateau there. Um, really was built up on rock. I mean, it's it's very difficult to get to, you know, and 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 so as a result, the Lord. And gives this message message through um, to Obadiah the prophet, and it's interesting because the what he's talking about cannot be understood if you don't know what the land looks like. So I'm going to read chapter one, one through four, while you look at this picture. Um, the vision of Obadiah. Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom: We have heard a report from the Lord, and an envoy has been sent among nations, saying, Arise and let us go against her for battle. Behold, I will make you small among the nations; you are greatly despised. The arrogance of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the clefts of the rocks. Now, he's making a little bit of a play here because he's t calling them arrogant and prideful and whatnot. You know, the prideful person is lifted up. And so he's t he uses that as an imagery contrasting here. The arrogance of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the clefts of the rock. In the loftiness of your dwelling place, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to earth? 
Though you build my, and build high like eagles, though you set your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. So he's not just talking about physically how they are lifted up. They're all, he's also talking about how in their minds they are lifted up. Their, their pride has made them lifted up. So um, he don't, Obadiah is a really short book, um, pretty much just the one chapter. Um, and I already mentioned about how Edom persecuted the fugitives of Judah when they were falling to Babylon. So the Lord's message against Edom in chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, and the day of the Lord in 15 through 21, verses 15 through 21. So just a real simple book, real simple outline. Uh, now, Joel prophesied around 500 or so. This was still during the time of Persia. In fact, the rest of the books that I mentioned are going to be during the time of Persia. Alexander the Great doesn't come until the 300s, and the latest book in the Old Testament can be dated to in the 400s, so um, B.C. B.C. Um, so his audience was Judah. His message was this, a plague of locusts had come to discipline the nation of Judah. Joel called the people to turn back to God before an even greater judgment occurred. So Joel means the Lord is God. Joel. Um, you notice that L a lot um, once you know it's there. Uh, so there was, there's a lost plague in chapter 1, the day of the Lord in chapter 2, verses 1 through 17, and then the Lord's answer in verses 18 all the way through chapter 3, verse 21. Um, Joel is a very interesting book, but it's important that you understand that there was an actual um, lo there were actual locusts that were um, devouring things. And so when he says there, what this locust has has left, this locust will eat. What this locust has left, this one will eat. He's actually talking about actual locusts. So chapter two, verses twenty-eight through thirty-two says. Um, It will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions. Even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Um, so it's important to note that after, he says they, the, a lot of prophets are saying all these judgments and everything, but then they end their books with these hopeful statements, and it's like, I don't think you got the memo. If you want somebody to do what you want, you have to intimidate them. You don't give them hope and encouragement. But see, in ministry, that is what you do. You don't beat people over the head like they're some kind of cows. You guide them like they're sheep. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, Zion is mentioned. We already talked about this. Zion can stand for a lot of different things. The Temple Mount in Jerusalem, Jerusalem itself, Judah as a whole, Israel, the people of Israel, the church, the heavenly city. I mean, really, go down the list of things that it can mean. Um, so uh, just pay attention to the context of, of Joel. Um, as it uses it. That takes us to the book of Esther. Now, God never appears in the book of Esther, which um, may seem like a surprise to some people, but remember, the point of Esther is, you know, is more focused on what people can accomplish. You know, when you when you submit yourself to God and you do what he's called you to do, even if it's scary, he can do great things for you. Now, Esther is not really to teach theology and the things that people say. So I know, um, for one, uh, I think it's Mordecai says, you know, hey, if you don't do what, um, what, if you don't do this, somebody else will come along. But in real life, it's not always like that. Sometimes God calls you to do something, and he won't just call someone else to do it. It doesn't get done. You know, um, I think of King Saul, for instance. Uh, where God told him to defeat the Amalekites, and he didn't, and it didn't get done. Um, you know, and I, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of examples like that um, where uh, God didn't just call somebody else to go do it. So Mordecai was wrong in this sense, but the essence of what he was saying, first off, he was trying to motivate Esther to do. He was trying to get her to do something about it, especially when it was in her power. But then second off, the principle did remain in that situation. Um, they were Israelites. They were out of their land. They were in this in this this foreign land. If they were to die, no big whoop. I mean, nobody there would have remembered them. You know, they would have just been forgotten, dust in the sand. You know, um, so uh, it happened between the two emigrations of Ezra. So it happened between chapter one and chapter seven somewhere. <laughs> Um, and, and the key theme here is that God is in the details. Although he's not specifically mentioned, although the law itself isn't really even mentioned, 
um, you still see God in the details. Is it just coincidence that all these things happen? That she just happened to go, in, go into the court? That Mar Mordecai just happened to hear what was happening? That Mordecai had previously saved um, you know, the king? I mean, unlikely. Unlikely that all this is just coincidence. Um, but we do see um, some some things that, that are very Jewish. First off, excuse me. Ooh, lunch is not sitting quietly with me. Um, first off, we see... Um, monotheism, and, and, and once again, that that monotheism, and, and that was a threat for Rome later on in the New Testament church, but it was also a threat here um, at the time um, of, of Esther. Um, uh, what is his name? Uh, Haman actually go, uh, talks about this, how they don't uh, worship the same as the Persians do, and how this is a bad thing, and how it's going to cause harm to the empire. Um, and, and so he fears this. And it seems like he, he starts all of this because he he really doesn't like Mordecai. You know, and I'm just saying, if you hate somebody so much that you would kill an entire people because of that, I mean, that's a little extreme. I could be wrong, and it could be something else that caused him to want to kill them. Maybe he was genuinely afraid of this. I don't know. But whatever it was. Um, Esther is also um, specifically records the Feast of Purim. Um, in chapter 3-7, it mentions them throwing the lot um, there in, let's see, um, in, the in the first month, which uh, is a month, Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, um, remember King Ahasuerus, I mentioned him in a previous lesson, lesson that is, the lot was cast, um, per, that is, the lot was cast before Haman from day to day and from month to month. See, um, so that gets us on the Feast of Purim. Um, which is this is where it came from. I just thought that was interesting that it showed uh, where this where this Jewish celebra Jewish celebration found its origin. Um, now Esther, much like uh, Ruth, is written like a play. You know, you have all, all the events in the first chapter, and like the first I think it's the first chapter. Um, the 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 kings all excited the issue with Vashti, um, and so then uh, Esther enters in in chapter two. The, the setting takes place, and, and Mordecai saves the king, and is all ready. So then, in the in chapter three, you know, the, the it starts unwinding. Um, this doesn't mean that it's that it's not true. I'm just saying it, it's written like a play. Um, Esther uses strong um, irony. Um, the women are the ones who actually get this thing off of off the ground. The whole event wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for a woman, Vashti. Um, all the Israelites would have been killed. All the Jewish people would have been killed if it wasn't for a woman. And uh, Mordecai, a lowly Jew, <laughs> ends up ends up uh, uh, leading the wife of the king um, to approach without permission. I mean, this is this is this is some some you know extremism here. Um, and uh, remember, the Bible does use a lot of extremes to to teach us things um, because people learn better from examples from extreme examples than they do from just telling them something. So uh, we see God guiding, very, uh, very practical, um, it, it very, it, it, the theology isn't like way up there, it's very simple. And God is causing all these things to work out where if the people would just simply act, lives would be saved. And it's the exact same thing for today. You know, we like to think that sometimes, you know, we're expecting this golden light from above. Hey, do this. Well, not everybody gets a golden light from above. You know, Peter was just called, you know. He didn't get uh, from a boat. He didn't get any special revelation there. Uh, P Paul, yeah, sure, he got knocked off, off of his horse. But uh, think of all those who didn't, you know. And uh, Apollos, for instance, doesn't seem like he did. Um, Priscilla and Aquila. Uh, I mean, Stephen, uh, you go down the list, most people and didn't receive special illumination as to what God wanted them to do. Um, in fact, James puts it that, that, you know, hey, you don't have to really think, pray that much about it. I mean, God says what you need to do here, and that's true, true, um, true religion. Um, but, yeah, it, it, you definitely see that God, God does guide in, in the more practical aspects. You know, not always so, so far off and exalted, you know, not, not, not God not being exalted, but I mean the idea of being led sometimes isn't as mystical as what I mean to say, as we, as we make it out to be a lot of times. So, uh, there in chapter 1, verse 12, is where um, uh, Vashti refuses. And 7, 1 through 6, is where 
um, Esther makes her request to the king. In chapter two, it uses in verses two through three. It actually uses a lot of a lot of irony there. Mordecai ends up being exalted while Haman is dead. You know, the strong contrast from what you expected. Um, so Esther becomes queen uh, in chapter one and two. Queen Vashti, I already mentioned that. Mordecai's service in saving the king, I mentioned that. Uh, Haman's plot in chapter 3. Mordecai and Esther act to save the Jews in the next seven chapters. And then as a result, Mordecai is greatly exalted. So that takes us to the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi. Yes, we have actually looked through all the Old Testament books. If you go through the um, contents page of your Bible, you will see we did. We have done the impossible. Um... So, actually, funny thing is Malachi is actually the last one in the Old Testament, too. Last book in the Old Testament in in, in our modern translation. I don't know about the, the, the Jewish order. I don't know. Uh, but so he prophesied sometime between 470 and 433, the last prophet recorded, the last book recorded, the last of important things that, that – which en enters as into what's called the uh, um, the silent age. Uh, the 400 years of silence. Um, audience is Judah. Malachi means my messenger, and for that reason, a lot of times people have suggested that his name wasn't really Malachi, but that simply he was, you know, um, the Lord's messenger, whoever that was, just a random anonymous person. The message was the people had become complacent in their worship of God. They would soon be punished for their sin, but those who repented would receive God's blessing. In chapter 1, 1 through 5, it says, The oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, How have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau. And I have made his, made his mountains a desolation and appointed his inheritance for the jackals of the wilderness. Although Edom says, We have been beaten down, but we will return and build up the ruins. Thus says the Lord of hosts, they may build, but I will tear down, and men will call them the wicked territory, and the people toward uh, whom the Lord is an indignant forever. Your eyes will see this, and you will say, The Lord be magnified beyond the border of Israel. So, uh, that takes us to a very brief outline. And, and Malachi uses a lot of that. Um, you know, you say this, but I say this. It's just a, a, a kind of a, a um, format that he uses all throughout. Um, will a man rob God? And there in chapter 3. Um, do we not all have one father? In chapter 2, verse 10. See so a series of questions like that. So God's love for his people in chapter 1, 1 through 5. God's honor among his people in chapter 1, verse 6 through 2, uh, 9. God's concern about marriage in, in verses 10 through 16 of chapter 2. God's justice and patience in chapter 2, verse 17 through 3, uh, 6. God's concern for tithes and offering in 3, 1 through 12. Um, and um, um, I, I messed up there. It's actually um, 3... Eight through twelve. Okay, so um, it's God's justice and patience is chapter two, verse seventeen through chapter three, verse um, seven. And um, God's concern for tithes and offering is in verses eight. Uh, through 12. So God's love for the remnant in, um, in chapter 3, verse 13, uh, through chapter 4, verse 3, and then the conclusion in chapter 4, uh, verse 4 through 6. So that uh, real brief outline of, of Malachi. Um, like I said, the best way to to understand the Old Testament is to read it. I mean, watch this video, sure, but 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 do read it as well. And I want to make a, a few a few last comments. Um, so first off, you know, I already mentioned about Ahab was a really wicked person. He's repented. You know, there is – that's worth noting. I also want to say that, you know, the the Bible originates with God. So if you're having problems with your study, pray before you go to your study and ask, you know, the Lord, I want to I, I want to know – I want to learn about this. I, I want I want this to make to make sense. I, I want to learn from your word. Um 
uh, also uh, the, about the Egyptian periods. I know I was a little bit vague on this, but basically this is what's up. Okay, so there's the Old Kingdom, Intermediate Period, Middle Kingdom, Intermediate Period, New Kingdom, Intermediate Period. Or, I don't remember if there's an Intermediate Period after New Kingdom. But anyways, um, Moses, and I'm sorry, Abraham enters the scene during the Middle Kingdom of Egypt. Okay, Joseph enters back into the scene of Egypt during the intermediate period between the Middle Kingdom and the New Kingdom. This is when the people called the Hyksos had come and taken over Egypt. Then Moses comes into the scene during the New Kingdom of Egypt. So um, if, if you're interested, go look that up. A lot of interesting stuff about that. Um, And I also want to mention something about, about Israel being the new people on the scene. Now, if you remember, Israelites um, come from the semantic people, the Akkadians, uh, that had uh, infiltrated the Sumerian plain, okay? And, uh, you know, Abraham moves from there, and he doesn't allow um, his, his son to, to be wed to somebody from Canaan. He makes the servant go all the way back to Mesopotamia to get him a wife. And then Jacob goes back to Haran to get a wife. Um, which is, remember, where Abraham's dad died. Um, so, you know, when, when Israel went to Egypt, they were just a few people, if you want to call them a tribe even. Um, but then when they'd come back, you know, come out by Moses, they were they were a people. They probably weren't that many, maybe tops of like 70,000 people, probably. Uh, for more on that, um, I explained that in the, in the lesson. Uh, I want to say somewhere on the Exodus to Numbers lesson when I was talking about uh, how many um, watch through there again if you missed it um, but probably there were 70,000 people I mean that's in, in total w old young women children I mean you name it um, and and you know they came back onto the onto the into Canaan and they really were a new people they were a new people Okay, it's not like they returned back to their land. They, they were they were nothing before, and then God brought them up into nation and brought them back. Um, and also, I, I want to talk a little bit about Sodom and Gomorrah. I know a lot of people, especially um, during, at the time of this recording, um, it's just we, we've had the shooting in Charleston, and then the um, uh, homosexual marriage was passed. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of people on both sides saying this and that. So I want to just give a little brief summation about what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. First off, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah were extremely wicked. Okay, it's not necessarily that they were just homosexual. Okay. Uh, second off, God had given them a long time to repent of their sin. Okay. Um, third off, there was a lack of righteous people. It wasn't necessarily that there were that there were gay people. Is that there was a lack of righteous people? God couldn't even find five righteous people. That's saying something. That place was extremely wicked. Fourth, the entire place rose up against the angels. It says everyone did. That means everybody had no 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 rule or guide or morals anywhere. And fifth, um, it is important that God said, I have to go see the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah. Eventually, they, I mean, not eventually, but it seems as though um, Sodom and Gomorrah had done such um, immoral acts to people that somewhere along the line somebody prayed against them or, or something sought God about them or, or, or I don't know or whatever happened um, there was an outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah and that is that is important so don't get carried away with the whole homosexual thing I mean I'm not justifying homosexuality and I'm not condemning homosexuality I'm just saying as a side um, and you know I, I, I will I will say this with homosexuals, you know, um, as Christians, we need to understand something. Okay, our sexual tendencies change a lot throughout life, but there are some people who will always struggle with a certain type of sexual sin. Some people have a sexual sin towards children. Some people have a sexual sin towards the same sex. See, what I mean, and and what happens is is people are tempted, and because we in the church have not accurately described what is human sexuality and so as a result you have um with without it without the church establishing a definition of what is sexuality 
you have people confused and, and you have people that say things like, oh, be a man. All that requires for you to be a man is a certain chromosome count. That's it. You don't have to go out there and fight wars and, and be all strong and muscly. That's not what's required at all. And all that you need to do to be a woman is to have a certain chromosome count. Just because you girls, uh, some girls have, have certain, you know, uh, manly tendencies does not mean that they are gay. And, you know, and we need to make sure that the things that come out of our mouths are affirming them. And also, when we meet somebody who's being tempted um, to sin in the area of homosexuality, we should establish the fact that... Um, you know that, that it is a temptation you know and what makes someone homosexual is when they partake of the act and uh, that's what also what makes them what makes them sinful and so we need to remember that guys I mean honestly I, I, I'm very disgusted at, at, at some of the things that my Christian friends have been saying you know online and whatnot it's it's very hurtful um, and I don't think that Christ's body is being honored I honestly don't think that the homosexuals are being respected either um, I think that it's very hateful, and I think that it uh, is unnecessary. Um, also, um, I, I already kind of showed you about chiasm, so I'll go ahead and skip past that. Um, but we've talked about um, the Old Testament prophets, okay? We've talked about the events that they happened in. Now, we didn't really talk about content, but we talked about the setting. We talked about the historical books and how history is never just recorded for the sake of history. We talked about the law and how a general guide to the law, not really, didn't really go that in depth about it. Um, but then we also talked about the, what's called the Pentateuch, which includes the law in it. Um, and we talked about the, the wisdom literature and how, you know, uh, they say things in an indirect way and in poetry and that kind of stuff. Um, so if there's anything I didn't talk, if I, I didn't explain it well enough, remember this course is this. The purpose of this course is not to go really in depth on everything. The purpose of this course is to simply to simply give a basic understanding and survey of the Old Testament to people who don't aren't very familiar with it. Hopefully help erase some of that confusion that comes with the Old Testament. Um, and then one last thing I want to say is uh, about the law. Um, we are no longer under the law. We are under grace. But that doesn't mean that we can live as lawless. So what, what happens is when we go to the books of the law and we understand the law for the Jews, there are principles that guide those laws. And if we understand those principles, we can understand how they apply to today. For instance, um, the, 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 ta the tabernacle is always spoke of, spoken of very highly in the Old Testament. Well, when you understand that we are the temple of God, um, you start understanding that, that we are responsible to conduct ourselves in a certain way because of our salvation. Not to earn our salvation, even after we've been saved, we get this idea that okay, we were saved by grace, but now if I don't if I don't do the task, I will be you know blotted off. Well, no, okay. Once again, your works never in the equation save you. Okay, your works are a response to the fact that you are now the temple of God. So, with that being said. Um, there will be another class on how to apply the Bible to your life. It's called The Art of Hermeneutics, um, which is a big, complicated way of saying understanding the Bible and applying it to your life, or an, interpreting the Bible, if you will. Um, so uh, one more thing on homosexuality, since, I'm already, since I already talked about it, and that's how we'll kind of end this course, because the Old Testament is usually associated with bigotry and, and bias and that kind of stuff. So let me say one more thing about this. We as a church have failed to live as holy in our lives. And we as a church, and actually as a nation, have treated marriage like it wasn't that big of a deal. And we really, we get married and, and have divorces just on the fly. Um, and then we throw that big of a fit about stuff, I mean, on both sides of it. The people who legalize gay marriage, you know, they're, they're going crazy about this. And the people on the other side, the Christians, are throwing a fit about it. Um, you know, and so you have two people throwing hate at each other to try to solve the situation. That's not going to work. Um, you know, maybe if the church would be worry about being an example to people and, and, and loving people like Jesus did, 
maybe the rest would, would work itself out. You know, um, honestly, if you want to reach the, reach the generation, reach your kids. Be good parents. Be there for your kids. Be there for your family. Don't put money first. Put God first and love your family. Love your wife. Don't stop looking at porn. You know, we justify our sins, but then we condemn the world for acting like the world. That doesn't make any sense. So when you read the Old Testament, I say all that to say this. When you read the Old Testament, understand it has a lot to do with today. Just because you have to do the legwork that Paul and Peter do for you in the New Testament doesn't mean that it does not have any purpose. It is still good, and it's not a book full of bias and nonsense like that. It, it, it does have human perspective in, in some areas, but it is inspired by God, and it is still beneficial for, for people becoming righteous, for the training of righteousness. Um, and so, so a, a, as you go in there, I hope you, you see the Old Testament in a new light, and I hope that you read it through. Read the Bible through at least once. You know, get in there. Really seek after the Lord. For those who study, they will find. They will find answers. They will find interesting nuggets, and they'll learn. And I think that's that's equally just as in, just as important that they learn. You know, as Christians, we we plateau, but the Old Testament can help us to learn to grow. Um, I hope you enjoyed this class. This has been um, the Old Testament made easy. I know I called it understanding the Old Testament for a while, but it is actually called the Old Testament made easy. And uh, this was a class that that uh, that I wrote uh, to to teach people in our community who had never had any experience with the Old Testament or or you know didn't understand how to apply to their lives or misuse the Old Testament and help teach them to understand how it applies to them and what it actually it means. So um, I know it was a very brief course. There are a lot of other places that you can go to for more in-depth treatments of um, aspects like theology and whatnot. Um, so I, 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 I hope that you enjoyed it, and keep an eye out for uh, the other classes that are coming soon. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Bye.